Okay. Oh, there's still a minute left. Well, good morning to everybody that's here so far. It looks like we've got 10. Okay. Well, nine. One, I'm one of you. Good morning, Rebecca, Nina, Michaela, Michael, Jacob, Jacob, Carl, Giovanna. Good morning. How's everybody doing this morning? Pretty good. Pretty fine. Good. 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 While we wait, it's just another minute for other people. Are there outstanding questions? Uh, are there problems from these sections? We're doing uh, problems from these ones today. Let me check WebAssign real quick. Um, maybe there are some there, but are there others? If not, we'll go ahead and we can get started um, with questions of my choosing. That's not a problem. Okay, now we're at 13, so that's half the class. I'm going to go ahead and start then. Um, so to those of you that just popped in, hello, welcome. It's good to see you. Um, we're working on problems from sections 1.11, 2.1, and 2.2 today. Uh, the homework for that is due on Monday coming up on uh, March 1st. So we're, we're almost through February here. Um, and next week, Wednesday, there's officially no classes. So that's March 3rd. That's the, uh, the school's, one of the school's spring di break days. Um, and it's also National If Pets Had Thumbs Day. So they're giving it to us. That's an important holiday, so we're taking it. Um, so, But next week, Friday, we still have that quiz due on 1.11, 2.1, and 2.2. That's March 5th. Um, so keep an eye on that calendar for things coming up. Um, aside from that, I think we can just go ahead and get started. I've got nothing else to really announce. Um, except that people have been emailing me questions, people have uh, I've been asking questions on WebAssign, and usually I've been um, recording a quick video of a hint or a full solution, and then posting it to YouTube. I hope that's sufficient and okay. Uh, uh, may maybe also you'll notice I uploaded all the lectures actually last week for this week's material, so I hope that wasn't too confusing. Um, I'll probably be doing the same thing for next week's lectures. I'll be maybe doing them today or tomorrow and, and posting them because I've my own courses. I've got a little bit of the lighter coursework right now, so the, no homework assignments right at the moment. So I'll try to get things done as I have time, which means early usually. Okay, <clears throat> so with that done, we'll go ahead and get started. One point eleven. <clears throat> so 1.11 was on solving equations <clears throat> and inequations, and this was graphically. Uh, so this is this is not too bad. Uh, I think I said this in the lecture many times, um, but this is something that is really difficult if you don't have the graph. It's something that's super easy if you have the graph. So this is question four. Uh, it comes in a couple parts here. So this is find the solutions to the equation 5 for some reason my pen's not working too well today. 5x squared, oh excuse me, 5x 5x minus x squared five x minus x squared equals four. And you know what I'm wondering is I'm wondering if 
my iPad screen is just dirty from little hands playing with it all the time. You've got a family during the lockdown, you know, the iPad is both your work tool and your children's fun time tool. <laughs> okay, maybe that'll fix it. We'll see. Okay. Oh, maybe. Okay, so 5x minus x squared equals 4. We got, we're going to try and solve this, but we're not going to try and solve it by factoring and solving. We're going to try and solve it graphically. So I will show you the graph. The graph comes like this. That is the left-hand side. That's this. So it's an upside-down parabola, and that's because we've got a negative in front of this x squared. And there are a few points that it goes through that are very nice and convenient. So one of them is this point, 1, 4. Another of them is the point 4, 4. And then the graph of the right-hand side is the graph of 4, the constant 4. So what kind of a graph is that? What is the graph of y equals 4? A horizontal graph? Yes. At a height of? Four. So I'm going to try my best to draw it here. This is really annoying when my pen is doing this. Okay, so it's a horizontal graph at a height of four. Now when you're trying to solve something like this, if you graph the left side and you graph the right side, like we've done here, the solutions are the intersection points. So we've got two of those, one there, one there. So what is our answer for part A? What are the solutions to this? The coordinates 1, 4, and 4, 4? Mm. They're pieces of the coordinates, yes. So the coordinates are the intersection points, yes. Right? That's exactly right. But what are we looking for in this equation? Which of those coordinates are we looking for, I should ask? Yes, exactly. Right, this, this there's no y's in here. It, it, you know, there's no there's no y in this equation at all. So if there were, then we would be looking for the whole coordinate. You know, we'd be trying to include all of the information that we could, but there's no y. So what are we looking for? We're looking for these x coordinates. So the solutions are x equal 4 and 1. And we can actually go back and check those. 5 times 1 is 5 minus 1 squared. That's definitely 4. And then plug in 4, we get 20 minus 16. That's definitely 4. OK, so that's part A of question 4. Part B is find the inequality. So find solutions to the inequality. Uh, and I'm going to just keep it up here. So now instead of an equal sign, now we're on part B. We've got an inequality like this, greater than. So we've graphed both of them. We know the intersection points. We know where they are equal. I can see here that the left-hand side is bigger in this part of the graph than the right-hand side. And so our solution is all those x values 
that make that true. And those x values are down here. Right? So we're not allowed actually to include 1 or include 4 because there's no possible equality sign underneath here. It's, it's strictly greater than. But our solution is this interval from 1 to 4. Okay, that's our, those are our possible solutions here. So this, this interval solves the inequality that we had, we had above. Okay, questions on this? This is one of the introductory problems. So questions on this one. How do you know to keep the circles open um, when you graph um, one and four? Very good question. Yeah, it's right here. We're looking at this sign. So what this means is the left-hand side has to be bigger than, only bigger than. It can't be equal to the right side. So when we, when we look at what, what happens when we plug in one, we plug in one here and we get five minus one, that is four, and four equals the right side. But we can't allow that because the, that symbol, this one, says it has to be bigger. So if we plug in anything bigger than one, like anything bigger than one, so that's why we use the open circle. We mean anything up to that boundary, but not including it. Then we're golden. <clears throat> Same story on the right side. We've got an open circle here. Because if we plug in 4, we get 20 minus 16. Great day. 20 minus 16. That is 4. And that's equal to the right side, but that symbol <clears throat> means only things bigger. We can't have the same. So it boils down to that symbol. And if it's if it's one of these, then you're going to have open circles. So it'll be intervals will be like this. I don't even know how that happened with this pen. Okay, this is just not going smoothly for me today. Okay, I'm gonna switch things up, hold on. So my handwriting is gonna be a bit messier, but I'm going to still have this. But, give me a second to switch something here. There we go. So I actually do the recording on something in some other program because of the whole recording of your faces thing. So I had to switch that around. So thanks for being patient. So my handwriting is going to be worse, but uh, this, this is going to work. So if you have one of these symbols, right, this is the greater than symbol or the less than symbol, you're going to have open circles at the end of your intervals. Okay. Uh, and you're, if you write it in an interval notation, it's going to be like this with um, with parentheses, curly parentheses. If you have one of these symbols, greater than or equal to, less than or equal to, then you're going to have closed intervals. That's for the most part what happens, OK? Other questions? How do you immediately get the intervals um, 1, 4, and 4, 4 from the equation? How would we get it from the equation instead? Yeah, like it was, like it somehow was in the equation, but how did you get it? So this is the equation. So you can solve that. Um, the way you do that is x squared minus 5x plus 4 equals 0. You would solve that. So you would factor it. X minus 4. Minus 0. X plus. 
x minus 4, x minus 1 mm -hmm. equals 0. Wait, how you got positive 4? Mm -hmm. Good question. Anyone? You move the 5x and the negative x squared to the right hand side of the equation. Yep, so I move these over to this side. And then out of habit, I flipped it all so that all my variables are on the left side. <laughs> if that's okay for, with all of you. Was that your question? Me personally, I would have like put the four on the other side though. Yeah, no, that, yeah, it definitely is less steps. Um, when you do that, the the whole thing is the same with with the change of a symbol so if everything's on the left side you have negative five sorry you have negative x squared plus five x minus four equaling zero so when you factor this you're gonna get the same things in here but everything's gonna have opposite signs or at least one thing will have opposite signs so it'll be x plus four with a minus x and then you'll still have x minus 1. And if you were to still solve this for the zeros, um, you still get 4 here. You still get 1 here, 1, and 4. The zeros are exactly the same. Did I do this right? Let me see. Did I? Negative x squared minus 4 x and 4x yep we're good that's fine yeah personal preference really uh, when you're taking your tests or when you're doing something else it doesn't matter which one of those you do um, for me um, I, it doesn't really matter at all the, either way works okay okay other questions about this problem before we move on Next problem. So that was number four. Um, the next one we will solve is this one. X minus five, this is question 15. This one is X minus five squared minus 80 equals Zero. I think there's a oh, and it's to the. What's that? Is there a question in the chat? Sorry. Hmm. How would it look in interval notation? Okay, so we had this graph. It went like this on the x-axis. It looked like this from one to four, and we highlighted our solutions here kind of open here, open here. And that's because this portion of the graph is above this other line, right? So when we, <clears throat> when we put this in interval notation, you know, looking at this x-axis here, we're saying it's in words, right? It's all input between one and four, right? Any input, any and all of them will work between one and four. So in interval notation, we've, we list, if we've got just one interval, we list what those two numbers are, and then we include these symbols. Now it looks like an ordered pair, right? It looks like a coordinate. But these, symbols, um, the parentheses, uh, uh, they're used in both coordinates and intervals, so I, I understand that can be confusing, like a really confusing, <laughs> even more so in this problem because this point here is literally 1, 4, so that's, that is definitely confusing. 
But in interval notation, when we when we have the context of any x in here, we're saying with these curly parentheses that we're not including 1 and 4, but those are the end points of the interval. So there's a relationship right here where we've got that open circle there at 1. So we've got a curly parenthesis here. We've got an open circle here at 4. So there's a curly parenthesis here. If we had 5x minus x squared greater than or equal to 4, then our graph would look like this. 1, 4. I know that's off, but I'm just trying to go quick here. Um, we'd have, well, our graphs are equal at these intersection points. The parabola is bigger in between those two points. So we can include 1. We can include everything in between them. Uh, and we can include 4. So now, instead of these curly parentheses, we use the square brackets with the same endpoints. So this is, this is the interval. x is in this interval. And so long as that is the case, then we know that the left-hand side is bigger than or equal to the right-hand side. Okay, I hope that, I think that answers your question. Okay, great, good. Uh, thank you for keeping me honest there and, and keeping an eye on the chat for me, everyone. Okay, so the next one is question 15 here, and it says to do two things. And it actually is a little bit messier than I originally wrote it. It's x minus 5 to the fourth power minus 80 is 0. And it says in the instructions to solve this graphically and solve it, uh, uh, solve it graphically and solve it algebraically. So that makes this problem a little harder. Okay? So graphically, this is where, you know, I think I said this in the lecture even, if you can't graph things well, right, usually what you do is you, you try and make a table of values, you know, plug in a few numbers, and find the, the outputs, right, and then plot them. But on things like this, the number of points that you would need to plug in it's not really obvious uh, how many you might need to plug in. So I guess the big thing that we're trying to find here is is a nice way to graph this without a graphing calculator and there just really isn't one. This is a great example of where algebraically it's a lot simpler than graphically. In particular it's because 80 is not a perfect fourth power of anything. So algebraically, I'll go ahead and work that out. We want to try and isolate the x, and then we'll go from there. But graphically, like I said in the lecture, I'm just going to graph this on a graphing utility. <laughs> and I'll, I'll show you a free one online that you could use. That's fine. Uh, or you could use your graphing calculator. That's fine. Um, but this is a good example of like a question I won't put on a test. I just won't, because you can't do it without a calculator accurately. Um, I might say solve it algebraically, but I'm not going to say solve it graphically because there's no way that you would get an accurate answer without a graphing utility. Okay, So I wanted to use this example at really any one of these numbers 5 through 16 because this is good, a good opportunity to say that and announce it. Um, but here we go. So algebraically, we want to isolate the x, so we'll add the 80 to both sides. And from there, what should we do?
What do you think? Is it set each side to the fourth root? Say what? Set each side to the fourth root? Yes, the fourth root. Perfect. So we're going to take really the whole equation. This is another way of writing that. And we're going to take it all to the fourth root or raise it all to the one fourth power. Okay. Usually it's written like this, but that gets the picture across really well, that we're taking the whole thing and taking it to the fourth root. On the left hand side, this leaves us with x minus five, right? On the right hand side, we're left with the fourth root of 80, which maybe we can simplify but we'll just leave it there for a minute. And I, I do have another question though. So this is some number, right? X minus five, it's some number. We don't know if it's positive or negative. Right? We, we don't. But that's an even root sorry, an even power, right? It's an even power. So when we go ahead and take this fourth root of both sides, we need to make sure, okay, I got that, Carl. We need to make sure that we're handling all the possible situations because an even power will eliminate negative signs. For example, if we take the negative fourth root of 80 and we square that well that becomes the positive square root of 80 and if we square that again the positive's already gone but that's equal to the just that's equal to just 80 and that's equal to overall the negative fourth root of 80 to the fourth. Okay, so what I'm trying to get across here is with any even root, you have to have that plus or minus sign, just like with square roots. It doesn't matter which root it is. Because in our original expression, we're taking the fourth power of something. And whether that is negative or positive, the fourth power, the even power, makes it positive. OK. So from there, we've got our answer. We add the 5 over, and we've got it. 5 plus or minus the fourth root of 80. OK, now I had a question in the chat. Need help with roots? Yes. So there's this, you know, the common one, square root of a number. The square root translates to a power, an exponential power. Um, and so does every root. Turns out that a radical sign, it's it's really like <laughs> To me, it's like this big arrow. Like, you take something like this, and then you're like, we're going to just bring this over here, right there. <laughs> and that's the same as the square root. OK? It's like, it's like indicative of what is happening. So this, this fourth root. It's like we follow the dotted line here, and we're like, oh, it's the same. 80, it's the same as 80 to the fraction 1 over 4. If you have any root, like the 28th root of a number, it doesn't matter what it is. Exponentially, that's the same as x to the 1 over 28. We're just taking this number, following the dotted line, and putting it right up there. What do they mean is a different story altogether. 
the square root is the is the easy case. The square root of four, right? We're, we try and think about this as what number squared gives me this number. We're saying squared because this is a two. Okay, the next easy example is a third root and the number 27 or the number eight, we could do that. The third root of eight, the, the answer to this is the number which is cubed, which gives us eight. That also is two. The third root of 27, the answer is the number which cubed gives you 27, three. Okay. So radicals, you should be able to do two things of them. First is interpret what they mean, kind of like what I just did there. And that'll help you actually compute them without a calculator, except in cases like this, because there's no obvious answer. Um, this four through of 80. But you should also, second, be able to translate really quickly between fractional exponents and radical symbols. Does that answer your questions in the chat? Maybe you just mean that you want more problems with radicals, I, I don't know. Yeah, you answer the question. Okay. Okay, well, we can definitely do more problems too with radicals. Yeah, that would be great. Okay. So let me, before we move on to more problems with radicals, let me share my screen here. Okay. So this is Desmos. And Desmos is a great online graphing calculator. Okay, it's just desmos.com. It's absolutely free, requires no payments or whatever. I think I've used it before for you. But we're gonna use this to, to solve this thing graphically. So we had the equation x minus five to the fourth power, which is kind of nasty, but you can start seeing what it looks like there, minus 80. So now it's really nasty, right? It looks like a problem, but it's way down here. And then on the, that's the right hand side, or the left hand side of the equation. On the left hand side, we have y equals zero, right? We had, a, we had nothing on the right side. So to solve this graphically, you need to somehow estimate these two points. So if you were to graph them, to solve this in your table, <laughs> you would have needed to get really lucky, right? You would have needed to pick the point two and you would have needed to plug in numbers about as big as eight. So I would say that means getting pretty lucky. Um, but just a quick thing here, that's 2.009 and 7.991. We can also see that five minus 80 to the one fourth is that number and five plus 80 is that number. So graphically we found them by just looking at the intersection points and specifically at the X coordinates, right? It's, al it's almost easy <laughs> to do that. It's just, there they are with a nice graphing utility. If you don't have that, and if you had to make this graph yourself, it would be a pain, just a pain. But algebraically, we can solve these as well. So that, that's also very nice. Right? Questions about solving those graphically? That's it's really not so hard. We just got to find a way to graph them easily and then do it.
None. Okay. So from this one, from this section, I don't really see I see one other. It says solve the equation graphically in the given interval, state each answer, round it to two decimals. So I don't think this is going to help, but we'll solve this one graphically. So this is question 22. The left hand side, well actually I'll write the whole thing out. It says 1 plus square root of x equals square root of 1 plus x squared. Okay, so that's that's what is written. So the way we graph that is we take the left side and graph it. So there's square roots there. We take the right side and we graph it. And then we look at intersections. There are two, it seems. Now I can zoom out and just make sure. Okay. Looks like there's just two. So if you were to graph these, you would probably find this intersection point of zero pretty quickly. So the x equals zero. And you would probably have to estimate this, right? You probably would have plugged in two and three and four, and you would have gotten something around here. So you've estimated that. But with the graphing utility, it's simple. Okay, so that's just that's another question that involves square roots here in this section. But from the book, there's nothing else. So maybe maybe this is a good chance to skip ahead to 2.1 and see if there's anything there, because that entire section is about just graphing things and solving them that way, right? How do you write those as answers, the uh, coordinates? How do you write those answers as co those coordinates as answers? Yeah. Okay. Uh, um. Great question. I'll come back to the person in chat in just a second. So, how do you write that answer? Well, so these coordinates, there's two things to them. There's the x and the y coordinates, right? But in our original equation, we were asked to solve it, and the only variables that are there are the x's. So solving that equation means saying what the x values are for those intersections. So the way you would write it, you could say it in words, uh, the solution is, or are, solutions are, x equals 0. Right? That comes from the x coordinate here, and x equals what is 2.315, am I remembering correctly? 2.315, yep. Because that's the x-coordinate at this intersection point. OK? Thank you. Yep. OK, why did I add 5 to 80 and subtract? So that was the previous problem. Yeah, it's okay if you can't go back to it. I, I think I got I, it. I can do it. It's not a problem. So <laughs> there we go. So for this one, why did we add five? So so on the left hand side, we took the we took the fourth root. We did the same thing on the right hand side, and then we mysteriously added five. Well, that's because we want to get the x by itself. So we have 5 plus or minus this fourth root of 80. And maybe that's where your question is. Really, it's why do we have that plus or minus? Yeah. Yeah, OK, OK. So it's, it's again, it's this, this thing that happens with even powers. So originally, we had this x minus 5 to the fourth. So I'm going to simplify it. It's just some number to the fourth. Well, that means that that's four of these numbers multiplied together. That's, that's the literal interpretation of this number. 
So let's say these are all positive. Well, we obviously get a positive result. Right, if A is positive, like two, then we get two times two times two times two times two, I think. So it's clearly positive 16. Does that change if the thing we plug in is negative? What if we plugged in negative two to the fourth power? Changes if you multiply a negative number. Mm -hmm. Well, remember that a negative times a negative cancels out, right? So negative two times negative two, that's positive four. And this negative two times this negative two is also positive four. So actually it doesn't change. The end result is still positive 16. So a positive number to an even power is equal to the opposite of that number to the same even power. So where did this plus or minus come from? It came from the fact that we had this 80, which was the result of taking some number x minus 5. I don't know what that is, right? x minus 5. Could be positive, could be negative. I don't know. All I know is when you take it to the fourth power, you get 80. Right? Well, I didn't even see the parentheses. I thought it was without parentheses. Oh, yeah. In that case, you're absolutely right. This, The convention of this means take the opposite of 2 times 2 times 2 times 2. Yes, and that is definitely negative 16. But if you've got parentheses, that means the whole of it is going to the fourth power. So, Giselle, does that answer your question? I, I, I suspect that does. Right. Yeah, that definitely does. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, we all need to wrestle with that sort of thing for a while. right? It's, it maybe doesn't sink in right away, but we need to keep that in mind. Whenever we're taking even roots of things, there's always that plus or minus because we just don't know if what we were squaring or taking to the fourth or sixth or eighth power, any even power, we don't know if what we were taking to that power was either positive or negative because both of those give the same number out. So just like negative 2 to the 4th and 2 to the 4th, they both give 16. Okay, great question. Thank you for asking. Anything else before we move on? I feel like I'm going a little too fast because we're getting questions about old questions. So if I'm going too fast, just stop me. So 2.1, I'm going to go ahead and clear the screen here. <clears throat> 2.1 was the next section. And 2.1 is on functions, which brings me to my first question. We had this earlier. Uh, x squared uh, was, uh, actually, I'm not, I'm not going to say it. Uh, we'll, we'll come to that in a little bit, maybe. Functions, we remember, were these things. <clears throat> I don't want to get ahead of myself. So functions are these things where uh, uh, for each input, there is exactly one output. That is a function. A function is a rule which has for each input exactly one output. Okay, so if you plug in one thing, you only get one thing. You can't possibly get two. Oh, there you go. A function is a rule which has for each input exactly one output. So for one thing in, you get only one thing out. There's no random grab. There's no possible two or three options. Okay. So in chat, this is a great opportunity for to get some interaction here. In chat, what are some examples of 
functions that you know of in your life, something where just anything, a rule that you really experience every day, uh, which whenever you do something, it, it always gives you the same thing. It gives you one thing out. What are some examples of real functions you, you experience? And then, these are the fun ones, I think. What are the non-function examples? What are some things where you know, you do something, but you don't really know what happens? <laughs> maybe it comes out this way, maybe it comes out that way. That's like, that's like, that's like a guy like shooting a basketball shot. Like, you don't know if it's gonna go in or not. Yes, 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 this is great. That's a perfect example of a non-function. So there's person shoots, and then there's two possibilities. It either, what do we call it? Well, I don't know what you call it. I used to call it a brick, right? Or it goes off the rim and out, so he misses. And then there's the score, or a basket. So there's, there's this. What about a vending machine for a function? Oh yes. I get, I used to use vending machines. Yeah, yeah. I used to use vending machines as function examples. You know, whenever I go to a vending machine, I'm a Pepsi fan. All you Coke fans out there, that's fine. I'm a Pepsi fan. And you know, so whenever I go to the vending machine and I put a buck in or whatever they cost, I press that button and I better get a Pepsi. <laughs> Cause if I get a Coke, I'm gonna buy it again. <laughs> Switch to water next time. Okay. Switch to water. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, yeah. Maybe I ask for water and it gives me. It better give me water. But if it has two possibilities, you know, Dr. Pepper, some DP, or maybe some root beer, I don't know. Cousin said Dr. Pepper. <laughs> Yeah, you funny, Professor. You funny. But do you see what I mean? This is this is a non-function. If there's multiple things for that one button you push, it's not a function. If there's multiple possibilities for that one thing, it's not technically a function. Some things can be changed into functions. This top one is a perfect example. Actually, both of them are. What if we talked about averages? Right, the average number of baskets made is a function of shots. So you take a person, you have them start shooting baskets and you start recording how many they've made and then you start calculating the average. The average definitely changes every shot they make and every shot they miss, but the way you're adding things up, number of misses, number of scores, this number right here, it's always going up. It's always going up. And so you get something new out every time. Right, you keep adding things in and then your average is changing as a function of the number of shots you take. So you can you can sort of finagle things. That's that's great. That's a good discussion right there. Okay, so in this in this section we talked about lots of functions. Um, so let's let's look at some mathematical ones. All right. So this one's number fifteen, and it wants us to draw a diagram. For the function f of x equals x minus 1 to the 1 half. So I'm going to draw that up here. So that's raised to the 1 half. I couldn't draw it as small as I needed to, but that's raised to the 1 half power. What's another way of writing that? Somebody help me out. The square root of x minus 1. Good. So that's that's the second thing I needed you everyone to be able to do is translate right away between roots and fractional powers. Whoever that was, you passed. Well done. A for the course. A for the day, we'll say. Okay, so we're just going to draw a diagram. So 
the way we can do this is we can list inputs and I usually draw a blob okay and then these inputs go into the function and the function is square root of x minus 1 and then the outputs is what happens is what we write here Okay, what are what's another name for the inputs? What are the what's another name for the possible inputs? Before we get into actually making some computations, what's another name for inputs? The set of all the possible inputs. The x values. Okay, x values. That's, yeah. That's like the variable that we usually give to them. Yes. There's another word. I won't let it go too long. Domain, right? All the possible inputs is the domain. Okay, how about the outputs? The set range. of all possible. Say it again. Range. Yes, range. Yeah. Outputs is synonymous with the range. Okay, so let's take a few of these. Let's take, let's take five. Take three. Take negative one. We'll take one. So our diagram for each of these is just gonna connect an input to its output. So what's the square root of 5 minus 1? Two. 2. Very good. So 5 gets connected to 2. That's it. How about 3? Three? 3 gets connected to the square root of 3 minus 1, which is the square root of 2. So nobody, nobody tell me what that one is. I know that one's irrational. How about negative 1? The square root of negative 2? That's exactly right. and you say it like there's nothing wrong with it. That's great. <laughs> That's great. For me, there really is nothing wrong with that. We'll talk about that in a minute, maybe. How about one? One gets sent to, or linked to, what? Zero. Zero, very good. That's it. That this is this is a diagram, right? The, your book calls these calls these things sometimes machine diagrams because they treat this inner portion like a machine. So they they draw like a it's kind of, they draw kind of like this literal machine looks like a speaker kind of where like inputs come in over here and then everything sort of comes out this way like a I don't know like a hamburger grinder or something. You know, inputs in, outputs out. Um, this diagram is also acceptable. It's a totally fine diagram for what the function is doing. Um, usually you write the rule in between. You don't have to write it like that on an arrow. Um, you can just write one arrow with the rule over it or even just the name of the function over it. Um, sometimes that's written up here. But these are all diagrams illustrating what happens with this function. Now, for this course, this is a problem because this is an imaginary number. None of your calculators will tell you what that is equal to as a decimal um, because it doesn't have a decimal form. It's just an imaginary number. Uh, so for this class, 
in the diagram you really shouldn't put this in you should actually say that this is not it's not an allowed input so it's not in the domain so for any function if for anything really for any rule if there's a number or a set of numbers that when you plug them in they give you an imaginary number you need to throw those out you need to throw them out of the domain and say those are not allowed when it comes to classes later on in life um, calculus for example uh, you'll start to assess and analyze the results of these things I don't know how many of you are in engineering school right now are any of you in engineering majors physics majors okay maybe not that's fine so it, if you will be then imaginary numbers will become very important math majors they become very very important uh, but for the I'll say the every man or woman they're not so important uh, so we're just gonna throw them out meteorology yes okay uh yeah it depends on what you go into in meteorology, I suppose. It, if you're working with the systems, if you're working with the actual like models that you work with, a lot of it comes down to solving differential equations, Nina. And you're 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 taking a bunch of data and looking at you're looking at how you can solve the flow of heat, the flow of gases, right, across the the globe or across a local place and so you're looking at these heat flow equations and these are what we call differential equations where there's differences from one place to the next and that causes that causes gradients so things move from high to low that's a fundamental thing in meteorology so if you're working with the the models themselves then you definitely will be working with imaginary numbers someday definitely oh boy is right there should be a smiley face after that oh boy oh boy but uh uh, yeah, it, no, it'll be it'll be good. It's not something you have to get now, right? We, you build up to it. That's exciting. Okay, let's go to the next question. Um, here we go. I'm gonna give you a poll because I, I set one up here with uh, with domain and range, and I wanted to ask you that from this section. So here we go. Let me start a poll. I'll give you all a few minutes to work through this. Poll question is, find the domain of the function, and I couldn't write it the way I wanted to before, so this is the way the function should be. It's piecewise, so it's 1 if x is rational, and it's 5 if not. So x is not rational. My question is, what is its domain? There's a follow-up question, what's its range, but I wanted to ask the domain first. So I'll let you think about that for another minute or two. Are these like random questions? What do you mean? Are these random questions? Like, like are these like like counted towards your grade or something? Oh no 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 no. 
This is how I take attendance, remember. <laughs> uh, I, I haven't been in class. Yeah. No, that's fine. So the way I'll usually open up polls and I'll let them go for a few minutes. And then I'll usually say, actually, I'll say it right now. If you have not thrown an answer in because you don't know the answer, then go ahead and just throw any num any answer in. I don't care. Um, so that's what I usually do. So I'll give you another minute to just throw an answer in, whether you know it or not. Um, and then uh, <clears throat> this is this is my way of checking if the names that I see here on the right, you know, on my Zoom screen, if those really associate with a person that's actually sitting there and listening and paying attention. Um, yeah. So attendance for the class is, right, it's mandatory. Actually, for the first time, I think, in, for the most part, for the first time in the history of AMAT 100. Um, but it's because we had a, quite a few issues last semester with um, non-attendant students who felt entitled to to something, even though they weren't ever attending class or participating in any way. So, so we're trying to get people engaged a little bit more so that those situations, which are very awkward, don't come up. Definitely. All right, so I've got 14 out of 17. Again, if you haven't said anything, go ahead and throw one in. 15 out of 17, there we go. Just put one in. Go ahead. Do you do a poll for each section? I don't. No, I, I usually pick a question or two for the day. Um, so usually there's three sections and I don't usually don't have three questions. Do you want okay. me to do a question from each section? No, no, no. I was just wondering how like it works, but no, I just, yeah. I ran like, this is question 77 from the book. So I just randomly pick one that has a oh, nice, okay. you know, has, has an answer that's relatively short and sweet, easy to write. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to go ahead and end it and I'll share results. It's interesting. All real numbers, only one in five. Those are the most common responses. You're all onto something here. Or at least 10 of you are onto something here. So if we look at the real numbers, there's the numbers that can be written as a fraction. Those are rational. And there are the numbers that can't be written as fractions. Those are the non-rational ones. So you can split the real numbers exactly in half. If you, if you want to think of it that way. Half of them, half of them um, are rational, half of them not rational. So if, if, if we're plugging in a number X, it's either rational or not rational. So this is all real numbers. You can plug in anything. So the domain is all real numbers. Now the range, I said a follow-up question, right? The, the range here, it's only two possibilities, one or five. So the range is, is literally those two numbers, the set, one, five, that's it. Domain, everything, any real number. Output, the range, just one and five. About half of the numbers get sent to one, and about half of the numbers get sent to five. Okay? All right. Uh, next one. Let's find the domain of this one. I'll use a, a square root function. So this one I'm doing by the seat of my pants. I'm flying by the seat of my pants here, so who was it in the office hours yesterday? This did not go well when I did that. Uh, they'll remember. I was trying to solve a problem and I, uh, I had a couple hiccups. <laughs> and then about 10 minutes later, I realized what had happened and I was like, oops. Okay, so here we go. We're trying to find the domain of this function. Find the domain of this function. And the function is the square root of x squared minus 4. All right. So when you're looking for domain of something, you need to think about you know some of the properties of that 
the, str the properties of the things you see in it. So I see a square root, and I discussed earlier how you, you can't do things like the square root of a negative number. Right, that's that's not allowed because that results in um, that results in imaginary numbers, which is not real, which is for the meteorologist in the room. Okay, other things I see in here, I see that x squared. That's always a positive number. And actually, this x squared minus four, I see that I can factor that. So I look at this problem and I, I think about it for just a few minutes and I think to myself, what are the properties of the things that I see? What are some of the things that I've learned to do? And this problem, I, I think right away, I, I see that I can factor this and I will factor this, x minus two, x plus two, So after I factor this, now it now it's a question of oops. Now it's a question of how do I make sure that what's underneath there is not negative? Right? If I'm looking for the domain, I'm looking for the allowed inputs. So the allowed inputs are the x's that make sure we don't have a negative number. I'll say it again. So the domain is the allowed inputs. That means we're looking for the inputs that give us a positive number underneath the radical sign. If some number is going to give us a negative number, like for example, we plug in 1, if we square that and subtract 4, we get negative 3. We can't take the square root of that. That's an imaginary number. So 1 is actually not in our domain. So we're, we're trying to look for all those numbers which give us a positive number under the radical. We're looking for all those x's which give us a positive value underneath here. So. To answer this question, what's the domain? We really need to answer this question. Oops. This one. Sorry, I clicked on another window. We need to, we need to answer this question. Where is x minus 2 times x plus 2 greater than or equal to 0? Right? If we can, if we can solve this then we will know the domain. Just because if, if we find out all these numbers that make this product positive, well then we know all the numbers we can plug in to have a positive result under the radical sign. So this is something that we've worked with. We can find the zeros. So this one has a zero of two. This one has a zero of negative two. Then we can write the intervals down around these so there's the intervals negative infinity to 2, negative 2. There's the interval negative 2 to 2. And there's the interval 2 to infinity. Right? If we, if we look at the number line, we know there's two numbers, negative 2 and 2, which make this product equal to 0. Okay, and there's this kind of basic fact that if a product of numbers, let's say if a product of the numbers is negative, in order for it to become positive again, it has to be zero in between, right? If you've got a if you've got a negative number and you start increasing it, and it becomes positive sometime later. Well, it must have become zero somewhere in between. So we use this fact that those t those two numbers, two and negative two, those are the zeros. This is where the whole thing is zero. That means it's either, you know, changing from negative to positive, or changing from positive to negative, or staying the same in each of these intervals. 
and it changes possibly at the zeros. It can't change anywhere else. So we sort of do this sign analysis where we look at the signs of these factors in each of these intervals. So we pick a number like negative 3, for example, and we check are these things negative or positive, these factors. So like negative 3, our first test point, we get negative 5 here, clearly is negative. Um, negative 1 here, clearly negative. But when we multiply these two numbers together, that's what we're trying to figure out here, the product of them, we get a positive result. So we found some solutions. If we plug in any number less than or equal to negative 2, those give us a positive number underneath the radical sign. So the domain, I'm starting to piece together negative infinity to negative 2, including negative 2. That gives us exactly 0. OK, how about in between here? Let's pick a point like we did before, 1. That gives us negative 1 and 3, which is a negative result. So if we pick anything in between negative 2 and 2, we're going to get a negative number under the radical. So that's not OK. We pick, it, we pick another point out here in this interval, 3. We get positive 1 for that factor, positive 5 here, which is a positive product. So this interval from 3 out to infinity also gives us a positive number underneath the radical sign. So our domain is like that. There How we go. Oh, I'm plugging, I'm plugging my test numbers into these factors. So negative 3 plugged in here gives us negative 5 and negative 1. So that was negative 3. 1 plugged in gives us negative 1 and 3. 3 plugged in here gives us, right, 3 minus 2 is 1, and 3 plus 2 is 5. So, so I'm taking these test numbers and I'm plugging them in to the factors. OK, is that clear? Yes. OK, other questions about this one? put it to you. I've, we've got another section that we can do, which is on graphing functions. Um, I, we'll probably just be able to do one or two more questions. So do you want to see how to graph a function? Or from this section, do you want to look at domains of functions again? Pick another question about domains, uh, maybe make it a harder one. Uh, and then from from the other section, it's just graphing things. So it's making tables and trying to figure out the basic graphs. What do you want? I hear I get one vote for domain, another vote for domain. Your graphing is fairly straightforward, you know, plugging in and domain probably. That's not a functional answer, Louis. <laughs> Maybe domain, maybe graphs. I don't know. <laughs> OK. So OK, from those that responded, we'll do domains. I don't know if you can hear my daughter. I, I think that she fell. I think, she, I think she's going to be all right. I think she'll be all right. Mom, mom is up there, so we'll see. 
yeah, these sorts of things. Like you never, you never see this in a normal classroom. <laughs> Thanks for being a part of my life this semester. <laughs> so here we go. Um, domains. I'll give you a harder one. Um, This one's good. Oh, that one's hard. Nope. Yeah, this one's okay. So this one is 71 from your book, uh, from your online book as well. And it is find the domain of x plus one squared divided by, I'm just gonna rewrite that, x plus one squared divided by the square root of 2x minus 1. So find the domain. Okay, so the first thing that you need to be careful for, right, you're looking at this, and you're looking at what you're dealing with. You've got a square on top, you've got a square root on bottom. And the first thing you need to think about is the properties of these guys. So I, with the square root, first, can't have negatives under that square root. That's the first thing, okay? The second thing you should probably take note of is that you're actually dividing in this problem. We weren't dividing in the last problem we did. We're dividing now, right? It's some number squared divided by the square root of some number. So can we divide by everything, or do we have issues sometimes with division? Can't be zero. Yeah, can't divide by zero. Okay, so in order to figure out domain, we're going to start looking at these two problems that we could have, division by zero, negative square roots, and we're going to start piecing together which inputs cause the problems. So we can start with either one of these, but I, also, I would start with number one. And maybe you guys can, can try this on your own. What numbers give you square roots of negatives? So 2x minus 1, you need to make sure is positive. So it's bigger than or equal to zero. It could be zero, right? So first, we need to make sure that's positive. So can you solve that for me? X is greater than or equal to one half. Perfect. We add the one over, divide by two. Very good. So if we plug in a number bigger than or equal to 1 half, we make sure that we have a non-negative number under that root. That's great. Okay, so that's it. So this is good. That's pretty much good for the domain so far. But we need to be careful of this one now, number 2. So out of these numbers, do any of them give us a 0? So, so far we've got one half here, that's kind of our division. And we've learned that everything to the left is not good. Those give us negatives. Everything on the right is good. That gives us positives under the radical. So my question is, do any of the numbers from one half to positive infinity give us a zero in our division. Any of these numbers here? If not, then we're good. If yes, we need to take it out. I don't 
hear anything, but I claim that you've already solved this. <laughs> I claim that you already know which one gives you zero. So you look at 2x minus 1. What number is right on the boundary for that thing being positive? It's 1 half. Thank you, Jacob. Yeah, it's 1 half. Over here, we get negative numbers under the radical. Over here, positive numbers. But right here is where that sign changes from positive to negative, which means right there, we've got a zero. When you have a continuous function, continuous graph rule, you if you change from positive to negative, you must have had a zero in between. So 2x minus 1 is zero when you plug in 1 half. You figured that out right there. So we know our domain. We can't plug in anything to the left of 1 half. That gives us negatives under the radical sign and we can't plug in one half because that gives us zero in our division problem. Anything to the right of one half is okay. So as a graph, we'd have an open circle at one half and a, an arrow to the right. As an interval, we'd have an open parenthesis at one half, positive infinity with an open parenthesis. So x is somewhere in one of these guys. OK? So that's it. You've, you found the domain. It's right there. So we don't mess with the numerator at all in this equation? Yeah, so Michaela, like, when you look at what the numerator is saying, it says take a number and add one. I don't think you'd have any problems adding one no matter what number I gave you, right? You would just increase the units digit. And then squaring. Right from a young age, we were learned to multiply two numbers. And there, there's never problems multiplying two numbers. You, you list out the digits up here, you list out the digits down here, and then you go digit by digit, multiplying across, and you add them together. There's a well-known method for that. And there's no exceptions. Just take the two and multiply them. So that top, we have no issues with, with actually computing that. So that, that first thing, when we looked at that problem as a whole, yeah, I skipped over that. I said, I can do that. You all can do those, those things. But then I saw the problems. Possibly we can't have negatives. We can't have zeros in that fraction you know the de the denominator or inside the uh, the square root those are the issues that we come up with usually the numerators don't give you issues it's usually the denominators um, and then radicals obviously other questions Okay, well, uh, that's, that's the time, 923. If you've got other questions uh, that weren't answered, then please go ahead and shoot me an email and I will make a response. Uh, sometimes I, I uh, just respond right to the email, but other times if it's more involved, I'll make a YouTube video and I'll post it of it, just like a little few minutes, uh, three to seven minute video of, of an answer to your question. Uh, and then I post that and everyone can see those on the class playlist. Uh, so. So you can do that if you still have questions. Um, again, this Friday, we have a quiz on sections 1.8, 1.9, and 1.10. And then next Monday, homework for 1.11, 2.1, and 2.2 is due. Uh, we've got office hours tomorrow from 1.45 to 3. And uh, I think that's it. I think that's it until we meet. Ah, oh, that's right. Next Wednesday, we're not meeting, right? It's National If Pets Had Thumbs Day, so we're not meeting. We, we've got to take that holiday off. It's important. So take it easy that day. But um, I guess I'll see you in two weeks unless I see you in office hours. Okay? Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. I'll see you all later.
拜。